This is hosted by the Paleontological Research Institution, and there is David Slime. Tonight we'll be hearing about why sharks matter, and I am going to stop sharing and hand it off to David. Oops, I guess I already stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, David. And thank Great. you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here with you tonight. Uh, this is actually the my 50th book tour talk. So it's a, a, a special one for me here. And I'm glad that you're here with me. I want to be talking to you today about why sharks matter, which is both the topic and the title of my new book. I live and work in the Washington, D.C. area. I am a marine biologist who studies threatened species of sharks and how to protect them. And I'm what's called an interdisciplinary marine biologist. And that means I don't just study the fish. I also study the people side. I study the laws. I study the economics. What do people want? What do people know? What do people fear about these animals? And all that means is every day is a little bit different for me, which is a lot of fun. Some days I'm out uh, working up sharks, off, usually in South Florida, though I've done work in other places. I'm often on the news. Um, I speak with policymakers in and around the Washington, D.C. area and other places around the world. And sometimes I get to uh, dress up like an idiot and talk in schools and things like that. And as I mentioned, I've been traveling around all over, mostly in person, but some virtual, giving the versions of this very talk for the past six months. I'm also one of the most followed scientists in the world on social media, and I invite you, if you want to learn more about this topic, to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Why Sharks Matter. I also have, I'm all, at Why Sharks Matter on just about every social media platform you can think of, but those are the ones I most actively use. I have loved sharks for a really, really long time. Uh, I'm four years old in that photo, and tonight I want to Don, are you able to make me not a co-host so that these things stop popping up? Sorry. I keep yeah, hitting I can, I can do that. I, I keep hitting hide floating meeting controls, but right. okay. Right. Uh so tonight I want to talk to you about sorry, everybody. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe I can't actually stop uh, stop you. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll make it we'll do the best we can, and I apologize for the uh Zoom pop-up interruptions. So tonight I want to tell you a little bit about why I have I have loved sharks for so long, why they've held my attention for so long, and some of the things that I've learned in a lifetime of being obsessed with them and a career studying them. Uh, and in doing all of that, I'm going to introduce to you some of the themes of my new book, Why Sharks Matter. At the end of the talk, there'll be plenty of time for questions. I'm happy to answer anything that you want to know about sharks, about marine biology, about ocean conservation. I love sharks for so long. Why do they hold my attention for so long? What is happening with sound? Are other people hearing this? Lifetime of being obsessed with them and career studying them. Okay, thank you. That was that was my bad. No problem. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has about any of this stuff. I just ask that you please hold your questions to, until the end, especially don't use the chat box now because that makes a big pop-up window appear that disrupts the slides. So one thing that I absolutely love about sharks, and there's more fascinating stuff along these lines every day, is that sharks are weird. They have all these amazing biological features that other animals just don't have. And that starts on the inside. Sharks' skeletons are not made of bone. Your skeletons are made of bone. So is your dog or cat or a bird and even other fish like a tuna or a bass or a goldfish. Their skeletons are made of bone. But sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras, their skeletons are made out of cartilage, which is what our ears and nose are made out of. So it's much more flexible than bone and it's lighter than bone. Uh, that So sharks are fish, but they're a different group of fish than the tunas, bill, or the tunas and goldfish and bass and things like that. Those are the bony fishes. Their skeletons are made of bone. And sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras are the cartilaginous fishes. Their skeletons are made out of cartilage. Sharks also have this whole other way of perceiving the world that we do not have at all. They have an electric sense. The, they can sense electromagnetic fields. Uh, let me tell you why that's helpful if you're a predator. 
if we're trying to find prey and it's hidden under the sand or under the mud, we can't see it, we can't hear it, we can't smell it, we're going to go hungry. But sharks know it's there because they can sense the electricity given off by the shark's beating heart. Really cool stuff. They also use this to navigate in the open ocean where there's no street signs, there's no landmarks, sharks don't have GPS. So how do they know where they're going and end up at the same beach every year? Well, they use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. The, uh, this article, I wrote this in the May issue of American Scientist magazine. It's about the, the scientist who discovered this electric sense, Aud Kalmin, who just died in December of last year. Uh, so if you want to learn more about this, it's in the May issue of American Scientist, and it's freely available online. There are a lot of different types of sharks. Uh, when, when I give versions of this talk at, at children's story time hours at, at libraries, I have the kids shout out shark species and see how many they can get in 30 seconds. And we usually get 20, 25 shark species. But there are 536 known species of sharks. And there is a new species of shark, skate, ray, or chimera discovered somewhere in the world every two weeks. Some live under Arctic ice. Some live in the deep sea where it's so dark that sunlight never reaches. Some uh, live on coral reefs. The US Navy SEALs have a saying that if you wanna know if there's a shark in the water near you, you dip your finger in the water and you taste it. And if you, the water tastes salty, that means you're in the ocean and there's probably a shark near you. And that's true, but it's incomplete because some sharks live in rivers and lakes. The smallest species of shark is smaller than your forearm, only a few inches long. The largest is the size of a school bus. Some are striped, some are spotted, some are blue, some are gray, uh, some are brown. One is bubblegum pink. So just an incredibly biodiverse group of animals. I will introduce you to some of my favorite weirdos here to give you a sense of the diversity of this group. In the lower right, you have the American pocket shark. It is not called that because it's small enough to fit in your pocket, though it is. It's called that because of the weird pocket behind its eye that's full of glow-in-the-dark liquid that it can squirt on command to scare away predators. In the lower left here, you have a mega mouth shark. That is a deep sea filter feeder, and they have bioluminescent or biofluorescent gums. So they open their mouth and it generates light. And they live in the deep sea where there's no light and animals go to investigate what's going on and swim right into the mega mouth shark's mouth. Another thing I love about mega mouth sharks is their scientific name. Most scientific names translate to something like the brown bird with the gray spot on its head. This is Megacosma pelagios, the giant mouth of the deep. By scientific standards, that's practically poetry. In the exact center, you have an angular rough shark, a deep sea Mediterranean species. Most people think of sharks as being sleek, athletic, fast, powerful. Angular rough sharks are the exact opposite of that. They are the couch potatoes of the ocean. So I've been relating to them more and more the last couple of years, uh, as I know many of us have. And I actually just got to see angular rough sharks alive a few weeks ago. Uh, I was attending a conference at a big aquarium in Spain and they had these on display. It's the only aquarium anywhere in the world that has anything from this entire genus on display. And I was with 500 shark scientists from all over the world, and we were all just geeking out in this tiny room at this tiny tank. It was great. Sharks also have incredibly diverse behaviors. In the lower right here, you're seeing a goblin shark. Lots of animals can hyperextend their jaws in front of their face. Uh, snakes famously do this, but nothing does it as far as a goblin shark does, and almost nothing does it as fast. That video is slowed down a hundred times so you can see what's happening. In the upper right, that is not slowed down. That is the cruising speed of the adult Greenland shark, the slowest moving large animal in the ocean. But they're in no particular hurry because they can live to be 400 years old. They are the longest lived vertebrate on land or sea. Um, they also eat polar bears, the largest land predator. These guys eat them. In the upper left here, you're seeing a thresher shark whose tail can be as long as the rest of its body combined. And until 2013, scientists had no idea what they did that, what they used that for. And then this video was taken by a scuba diver in Indonesia, and it shows that they use their tail as a whip to make a shockwave that stuns prey. 
Here you're seeing a hammerhead. One of the things they use their hammer for is to pin flat prey like stingrays here against the bottom where they can get munched on. I once saw a hammerhead skull that had 70, 70 stingray barbs through it. So those stingrays defense mechanisms were not especially helpful. This is a kite fin shark. This is the largest of the species of sharks whose whole bodies glow in the dark. Uh, this is about a meter long when it's full grown. But there are actually lots of species of sharks whose whole bodies glow in the dark. They're called the lantern sharks. And my favorite lantern shark is called the ninja lantern shark. It is called that because my friend and colleague who discovered it, Vicky Vasquez, did so right around the holidays and went home to her family. And everyone was talking about what's new at school, what's new at work. And she said, well, I discovered this new species of shark and I get to name it whatever I want. And one of her young cousins runs into the room and says, ninjas are cool, call it the ninja shark. And she did. Uh, shark reproductive behavior in biology is also fascinating. And I apologize, it is not possible anymore to come to a shark talk and not get at least one baby shark joke. So I apologize to the parents here, but I don't make the rules. Uh, some species of sharks give live birth. You're seeing here a lemon shark being born. As soon as it's born, it just has to be a miniature shark and take care of its own, uh, take care of itself. Uh, it does not, um, uh, sharks don't have parental care of any kind. Some sharks lay eggs. This is actually a skate egg case, sometimes called a mermaid's purse when they wash them on beaches with the top removed so you can see what's happening inside. Some sharks have a weird mix of this that is only found in sharks in which uh, the egg hatches inside the mother and then grows up uh, and then is born as if live birth after a few weeks. Some sharks can clone themselves called parthenogenesis. If a female shark does not have a suitable mate and wishes to become pregnant, she can just become pregnant. And instead of the babies being a mix of the DNA of mom and dad, they are just exact clones of mom. So incredible biodiversity and uh, here. When, so why do I love sharks so much? It's because they're amazing and weird and there's new stuff being discovered all the time. And when most people think about sharks though, they think about sharks as a threat to you and your family. But that's, that's not really something that you need to worry about. Every once in a while, a tragic accident does occur, uh, but it's just astronomically unlikely that you're gonna be injured by a shark. So why is it one of the most common fears that Americans have? Uh, incidentally, three of the five most common fears that Americans have are flying, public speaking, and sharks. So my summer would have been just a nightmare for a lot of people. Uh, but Jaws, the movie Jaws, is one of the reasons why people are so afraid of sharks. Before this movie came out, a lot of people didn't really think about sharks that much. Fishermen did, surfers did, but people who were just at the beach didn't really think about what was beyond the water's edge. And this movie changed the world. In fact, we have something called the Jaws effect in the public policy literature, uh, which describes how a fictional portrayal of a real world issue influences how people really think about that issue. Uh, so Peter Benchley, the author of Jaws, was so horrified by how his movie that he thought was just a fun, entertaining story made people hate sharks that he spent much of the last years of his life raising money and awareness for shark conservation. And that ninja lantern shark I mentioned earlier, its scientific name is Benchley Eye to honor this. So when I say that sharks are not something you need to worry about, you might say, but I saw a news story where someone got bitten. Yes, you did. Um, and that does happen sometimes. But here are some things that kill more humans than sharks to put this in perspective. Flower pots falling on your head from balconies as you walk down the street kill more people than sharks. As a social media guy, I love this one. More people fall off, fall off cliffs while trying to take selfies of the scenery behind them than are killed by sharks. More people are bitten by other people on the New York City subway every year than are bitten by sharks in the whole world. So this is just not something that you need to worry about. But not only are sharks not bad, they're actively good. They help keep the food web in balance. And when we're talking about the ocean and our coasts, these are food webs that provide billions of humans with a B with foods, with food and food security and nutrition. 
They provide tens of millions of humans with jobs and livelihoods. We very much want our oceans and coasts to be healthy, and that means making sure the food chain is healthy, and that means making sure that the top of the food chain is healthy. What you're seeing here is a food web off Cape Cod. Each of the individual boxes are a fish or a marine mammal or a bird or an invertebrate found off Cape Cod, and all the lines, all the arrows are ecological interactions between these animals. If I were to pull one thread from this web, it probably wouldn't, the whole thing probably wouldn't unravel. But if I start pulling a bunch of threads, it might, and that would be bad news for a lot of, of species, including humans that depend on this food web. We wanna keep the food web as complex and intact as possible because messing with it has a variety of unpredictable, but often quite bad effects. Sharks are uh, some of the most threatened vertebrate animals in the world. The problem is so bad and has gotten worse so fast that this infographic from 2015 is already out of date. It's already worse than this. Uh, this says that about a quarter of all known species of sharks and rays are considered threatened with extinction. It's now closer to about a third, and that's just since 2015. The number one threat by far are so much that there's functionally not a number two threat is unsustainable overfishing practices, humans killing sharks. This includes killing sharks on purpose, um, and it includes killing sharks accidentally through what's called bycatch. That's when you're trying to catch a tuna and you accidentally catch a sea turtle or a dolphin or a bird that was near that. Um, many people have heard of shark fin soup as a threat to sharks, and it, it certainly is a threat, but it is a rapidly declining threat. It is often wrongly treated as the largest or only threat, and it is absolutely neither of those things. And you might be thinking, wow, the shark, uh, shark fin trade has declined dramatically since the early 2000s. That must be great news for sharks. But remember how I just said that the problem for sharks has gotten much worse in the last decade. What's happening? The shark meat trade has exploded in that time. This notably has different end markets. It involves different species and there are different laws needed to protect it. So if you're focusing only on fins, you're only focusing on part of the story. I've also observed Lots of people in the ocean conservation community who tell me that this, a bowl of shark fin soup, that's evil, that's vile, that's repulsive. But this, a grilled shark steak, that's fine because that's how normal people eat fish. Other than the fact that that makes no sense at all from a conservation perspective, either way there's a dead shark, it's also super racist in ways that are counterproductive for our goals as conservationists. You can be forgiven if you've never heard of the shark meat trade though, because we did an analysis of how shark conservation is portrayed in the English speaking media around the world and found that the shark fin trade is mentioned six and a half times as often as the shark meat trade, even though the shark meat trade is a larger and more rapidly growing threat and one that people in English speaking media markets are more involved with. So this is bad news. Another thing that I've learned is that this is, there is a very real challenge that we face here, but it is not a lost cause. Scientists and managers know how to protect these animals. We know what policies work. We know when they work. We know what we need to make them work. We know when we need your help to make them work. And we know when you're doing stuff that's not especially helpful. In fact, this is a big part of the reason why I wanted to write my new book, because there is not another guide that is accessible to the public out there to all the different conservation laws and policies and who enacts them and what pieces of evidence and help they need. A lot of shark books that are out there are just collections of fun facts about sharks. And then on the end, they say, uh, sharks are in trouble, don't eat shark fin soup, and you're doing your part to save sharks. But most people who are reading these books are already not eating shark fin soup. You didn't come here for a law school lecture, but I do want to briefly introduce you some of the conservation policies that are available. Remember, the number one threat facing sharks is unsustainable overfishing practices. And there's two main schools of thought on how to fix that. One is make the fishing more sustainable. We should still allow some fishing, but unsustainable overfishing is bad. So put in size limits. If it's too small, throw it back. Put in quotas. Uh, there, you can only catch this many in a year or per boat or per day or per season, things like this. If you've ever done any fishing of any kind, you're familiar with these sorts of rules. In recent years, there have been newer policies called limit-based policies that say, no, we should not allow fishing for sharks at all. We should not sell shark products at all. And these are things like shark sanctuaries and shark fin trade bans. 
This is, if any of you have ever taken an environmental science 101 class, this is the John Muir Gifford Pinchot debate of conservation versus preservation. What is the point of nature? Should we protect nature so that it provides benefits for humans, or should we protect nature just because it's nature? It's an old argument, but it's, this is a new front in that war. Um, most Westerners would probably agree that anchovies are a natural resource to be sustainably exploited and managed. Most Westerners would probably agree that the great whales are wilderness to be preserved. And sharks sort of fall awkwardly in the middle here with um, some people feeling very strongly that they're on one side or another of this. And as an interdisciplinary marine biologist, this makes this space a really fascinating area to work in. If you have never heard, by the way, of sustainable fishing for sharks and you consider yourself pretty knowledgeable about ocean conservation issues, I want you to know that I surveyed all the shark scientists and we found that 90% of shark scientists say that the goal of shark conservation should be sustainable fishing, not bans on all fishing and trade. And if you've never before heard of a topic that 90% of credentialed experienced experts prefer, I would invite you to interrogate where you're getting your information from because there is a lot of nonsense out there. And finally, the last theme of the book and something that if you follow me on social media, you see me rant about a lot is that lots of people want to help sharks and that's great. Lots of people are trying to help sharks and that's great. But wanting to help and trying to help are not the same things as actually helping. It matters what we do. Some things waste resources without making the problem any better. Some things actively make the situation worse. There are lots of people who are well-intentioned but uninformed and don't really know what's going on. And they Google this and the first hit they find, they adjust their life thusly. And, they, and, and if that first Google hit was something that was written by someone who doesn't know what they were talking about, this is bad news. There are also a lot of unscrupulous people who exploit the well-intentioned but uninformed and intentionally put misinformation out there and say, oh, you can't trust mainstream scientists and environmentalists. Give me your money and we'll fix it. To give you some examples of this idea of people who say they're trying to help but are not helping, uh, on the left here, you see a scuba diver grabbing a shark. There are people who grab sharks. There are people who hug sharks. There are people who ride sharks. There are people who kiss sharks. They take a shark, they hold it by the bitey end, and they put it on their face. And they say, I'm helping. I'm doing science. I'm doing conservation. I don't know what the heck is happening in this picture, but it is not science and it's not conservation. There are also these goofy, ridiculous, user-made petitions, which go viral on social media all the time. Change.org bills itself as anyone can change the world, anyone can make a petition about anything. But what that means is that a lot of people who have absolutely no idea what they're talking about make petitions that spread misinformation like this one to ban shark finning in Florida uh, from April of this year, which got 60,000 people to sign it. And not one of those 60,000 people was apparently aware that we banned shark finning in 1993. This is a petition that cannot possibly do anything to help because its stated goal was accomplished before the person who made it was born. All this is going to do is confuse people about what the problems are and what the solutions to those problems are, while also making people think that they did something to help today, maybe making it so they won't do something that would really help. So there are lots of shark books that are out there. Why did I want to write another one? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's never been a shark book like this one before. This is a book that is not a textbook. It's written for the interested public, and it is a comprehensive and accessible guide to the world of shark science and conservation. It tells you all the ways that we know that sharks are important and all the different tools that scientists use and all the reasons we know they're in trouble and all their threats and all the solutions to those threats and what you can do to help and who else is helping and how you can support them. Uh, there's never been a book like this before, and I've been absolutely thrilled by the reception that it's gotten. I got I was a starred review in the New York Times. I was featured on NPR Science Friday. Um, I passed Jane Goodall on the Amazon Science bestseller list. So this is, the reception has exceeded my wildest dreams. 
Uh, thank you so much for, for having me here as part of my book tour. As I mentioned, this is my 50th talk that I've given since the book came out in June. I've done this in 41 cities in four countries, as well as a few virtual talks. If any of you watching are sub represent a group that is interested in arranging another talk, and I can do things virtually, I can zoom into schools or libraries or whatever, uh, reach out and I'm happy to talk. Uh, before I uh, wrap up and take your questions, I have some folks I want to thank here. I want to thank first and foremost uh, the, uh, my family for always supporting my crazy career goals. When I was five years old, I told my dad I wanted to be a marine biologist, and he said, I don't know what that is, but I'll find out. And uh, now he's retired, and he brings his golf buddies on shark research trips with me, so I feel like I've made it in his eyes. I want to thank my publishers. I want to thank the science and the virtual pub team, especially Don, who has been very patient trying to find a time where we could make this happen. And I'm thrilled we were able to make it work. I want to thank my friends and colleagues for years of listening to me talk about my vision for a different kind of shark book. And finally, I want to extend a deep and sincere thanks to you for listening, because right now I'm, I'm living my, my childhood dream of traveling around the world and talking about sharks, and I couldn't do it if no one wanted to listen. So thank you very much. Before I take your questions here, um, I just want to tell a quick funny story about this photo. In 2019, I was a sponsor of the Sigma Xi conference, basically a national science fair. And I had this ask me anything you want about sharks booth. And all these, all these middle school and high school brilliant science nerds were coming up and asking me questions. We opened it up to the public. So the people of Madison, Wisconsin were coming in and asking questions. It was awesome. But at one point I got up to go to the bathroom and I got back and there was a 10 year old boy sitting in that chair answering people's questions about sharks. Uh, so I, I, uh, and I sat and watched him for a little bit and he got most of the questions right, even though he perhaps did not understand what the purpose of the booth was. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. I am thrilled um, to be or, or to be here with you today. Um, Don, I have done the hide floating meeting controls thing, which means I cannot stop screen sharing. Are you able to stop my screen sharing? <laughs> I think I maybe can. Um. <laughs> oh, Zoom. I've only been using it every day for three right, years. Right, right. You'd think yes, that we got it by now. Power to stop you there. Perfect. Uh, so thank you so much for listening, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone uh, that anyone has about sharks, about me, about marine biology, about ocean conservation, anything that you want to know. I do an Ask Me Anything every week on social media, which means that I can just about guarantee that the weirdest question you can think of is not the weirdest question I've ever been asked. Uh, so uh, I don't, I'll let Don MC the Q&A here. Yes, and I see we've got a hand up, and I'm also putting a link to uh, David's book in the chat there. Thank so, you. Uh, go ahead, um, E. Lewis. Hi, so um, I've seen a video about people swabbing the teeth of a shark to get the bacteria from it. Is that important to shark research or no? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the verb there. Are you people doing what to shark teeth? Swabbing the shark, like like taking like a toothbrush almost and like swabbing it like against the teeth. You know what they were doing that for? I'm not I'm not sure what you're referencing. I'm sorry. I think it was about like helping people from like shark bites, like when like the shark bites in, into the human, it like the bacteria can stop the spreading from it. I'm, I'm, I have not heard of that, but it makes sense. I just, uh, that's not the sort of stuff that I do, I'm afraid. Sorry. Thank you. And Rob's got a question. Uh, <clears throat> so I was wondering if you could say a few words about um, the relationship between um, shark decline and, and climate change. I'm sure that's a complex topic that could get its own talk, but are there any generalities about um, uh, changes to ecosystems from climate change and shark diversity or abundance? Yeah, so climate change is just not a big threat to sharks. Um, this always confuses people because it, it is legitimately a big thing, a big problem for a lot of marine species. But sharks, they typically just move. If the area where they're living now is suddenly too hot, They'll just go somewhere else. Uh, there are some species that are range restricted that they have to live in particular conditions or they have to live right at the mouth of a river and they can't move. 
But generally speaking, overfishing is so much of a bigger threat to sharks and their relatives than climate change that it's 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 barely even mentioned other than through, for a few endemic species in the Amazon and in, and in Indonesia. Yeah, that's interesting. And sharks have been around since like the Devonian, right? Something. There were sharks swimming in the world's oceans, not only before there were dinosaurs on land, but before there were trees on land and long before there were rings around Saturn. So it's a really, really ancient uh, group of uh, group of species. Okay, um, Anna's got a hand up and there's a question or two in the chat that we'll get after we go to Pat too. Cool. Hi, David. Long time no see. It's Hello. Um, so I have a question. Actually, a friend of mine was asking me because she was under the impression that sharks have a preference for yellow color. So that's why when she was leading a group of graduate students on a trip, she was telling them never to wear like yellow colored bathing implements. Is there any truth to that? Or is that one of those urban myths? So your friend did not make this up. They've heard, they've definitely heard that before. Uh, the phrase that surfers use is yum, yum, yellow. You don't want to yep. wear yum, yum, yellow. Right. Uh, but Lots of species of sharks are colorblind, so uh, I'm, I don't think there's much to it. Uh, what, what, something in particular that drives me crazy with wetsuit stuff is there's a, a stripey black and white horizontal stripe wetsuit that you can buy. And the people who make it say, this will make you look like a venomous sea snake so sharks won't eat you. But like sharks eat sea snakes, so maybe uh, maybe that's not an especially helpful tool. Shiny stuff is bad. Uh, that looks like fish scales reflecting in the sunlight. If you have a, a piece of jewelry that catches the light wrong, a, a shark might think that that's a fish. Uh, but color is generally less of an issue. All right. Thank you. Yellow wetsuits are hideous, however, so there are other reasons <laughs> not to wear them. That is true. That is true. <laughs> okay, we'll go to Pat, and then we'll go to, uh, after Pat, we'll go to some questions in the chat. Go ahead, Pat. Yep. Um, see, question, question and a, com a comment. You had mentioned um, the very, very slow shark that also eats polar bears. Uh -huh. How big is that shark? 18, 20 feet. Pretty big. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and the sea count is this, in my mind, is uh, similar to there's a video uh, about wolves being, being brought back into uh, Yellow, Yellow, sea, Yellow sea Stone Park and their effect and messing and messing with the with the um, the apex predator 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 is bad. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the the Yellowstone wolves are sort of a classic case study of carnivore restoration and ecology. Um, and there are some similar stories with in the ocean, but it's generally harder to study things in the ocean mm -hmm. uh, because the ocean destroys your gear and humans can't breathe underwater and it's thousands of dollars a day to use a boat. So it's it, so the, the sharks are sometimes called the wolves of the sea, referencing that very case study. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Mark's got a couple of questions in the chat. What do you think are the best oceanography type documentaries for a high school classroom? And we'll let you answer that one first and then we'll get to Mark's second question. Yeah, unfortunately there aren't many that are very good. Uh, and the the sure. most of the most known ones are, I would go so far as to say they're awful and I, students would learn more by not watching them. Uh, <laughs> one in particular that uh, was out last year and was one of the five most viewed things on Netflix last year is called Sea Spiracy. And it is just a dumpster fire of lies and nonsense that they've had to edit it several times in response to lawsuit threats. Uh, it is just you you are you you will learn more by not watching that movie than by watching it. Uh, there are some other ones that are similarly bad, but that one's very high profile. Yeah, yeah. And I'll note if if folks aren't aware, David is probably the leading critic of Shark Shark Week. And oh like goodness, it's been an interesting week, that. you guys. I just yeah, got slammed on Fox News the other night for criticizing Shark Week, and I have had to lock down my Twitter account and emails and everything. It's been a day. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. It's a. I, I've been following David on on Twitter for probably a year now or something like that and he's an interesting um person to follow and he's had a really interesting week um okay so mike uh mark's second question is are sharks threatened at all by ocean acidification and what ph range tolerance do they have yeah I, I, again it's just so much of a smaller problem than overfishing 
if we totally fix climate change and don't fix overfishing at all, sharks are screwed. If we totally fix overfishing and don't fix climate change at all, sharks will be doing great. We should fix both because they're both very real challenges to lots of things. But I, I just cannot stress enough how much of a, a difference in scale of threat there is here uh, mm -hmm. that sh sharks are, um, the overfishing is the problem. And James put in a link that looks like it is in response to the um, swabbing of teeth on uh, antibiotics uh, in great white shark, white shark mouths. So folks can check out that link. Um, and Ruben asked, what was the school path you took? Um, College Plus, can shark farming help the shark trade? And what's your thought on electric fields on beaches to prevent shark attacks? So a bunch yeah. of questions from Ruben. So I went to Duke for undergrad and studied uh, biology. Then I got a master's in marine biology. Then I got a PhD in interdisciplinary uh, in ecosystem science and policy at the University of Miami. Then I did a conservation leadership training postdoc and uh, now I'm a research faculty at Arizona State. Yes, we have a Washington DC campus at Arizona State. Um, we have a science policy institute here where I'm attached. Um, the other question was electric fields are not gonna be a useful barrier on a beach. When you make an electric field, it's just not very big. Uh, the power required to make something to protect even a small stretch of beach is like, I would rather power a small town. Uh, but there are electric fields are really useful at keeping sharks away from fishing hooks. So there's uh, there are ways to uh, reduce shark bycatch using those. What was the other one? Ocean acidification, or did we did that one? Well, that, we did that one. one. It was uh, can shark farming help the shark trade? Oh yes, yeah. Shark farming is not a thing. Uh, their life histories are just too crazy. They they to, to in order to successfully breed agricultural animals at a commercial scale you need a you need them to be able to like grow up fast and have a lot of babies and sharks just don't yeah they live, so live to be 400 that's not going to happen um and uh samantha asks i teach high school marine biology class and have students give presentations on different species of sharks that includes many of the aspects and issues you discussed one thing we don't discuss is what they can do to help with shark conservation what is the one one takeaway you think high schoolers should have in regards to this piece yeah um the, the single most effective thing that an individual consumer can do, and most high schoolers probably aren't doing most of the grocery shopping for their families, but some are, but they still have input, is don't eat unsustainable seafood. I'm not saying give up seafood entirely like CCRC does. That's unhelpful nonsense. But there are some fishing practices that are really harmful to sharks, to whales, to sea turtles, to the ocean. And not supporting those is huge. Other things you can do are donate time or money to reputable nonprofits while not supporting the crazy people, follow experts on social media while not following the crazy people. Uh, and if you follow if you follow me on social media a few times a year, there are opportunities for people to um, there are opportunities for people to, especially US citizens, to get involved in some management issues. And I share those along with instructions on how to be useful. It's important with that stuff that you don't just say something like, um, that you don't just say something like save the sharks, but you have to say, I oppose amendment 7C and instead support amendment 10B. Uh, and there's no way you would know that unless you are listening to experts. And uh, Anna asks, um, in related to the documentaries, what about the BBC Shark documentary or the Blue Planet documentary? They're fine. I, I don't know. Okay. It depends on what your goal is. If it's just, wow, look at cool animals, it's like that's the, the, the goals there are not education. The goals there are nature wonder. Okay. Um, and Ryan asks, what was some of your criticism? I assume that's of Shark Week. Which oh man, Shark Week! On. Shark Week is another dumpster fire of lies and nonsense. Uh, we have a new paper out in the scientific journal PLOS One, so it's open access. Uh, that we had two poor undergraduate volunteers who watched all of Shark Week ever and recorded what's in it, uh, what shark species are featured, where does it take place, who's featured, uh, what are they trying to do, where did they go, and just so much of it is just a waste of time nonsense. 
they have two, not one, but two specials where the guys from Jackass engage in wildlife harassment, but they don't have any specials on overfishing. They have not one, but two specials called Naked and Afraid of Sharks, in which cont contestants are not allowed to wear pants, but they are allowed to wear a mask, fins, and snorkel. And they do a variety of challenges that are like survivalist nonsense. There's no room for a story about the shark meat trade. It's just awful. And there's a lot of stuff that's actually wrong. It's not just what they don't cover, but it's not a lot of much of what they do. Yeah, and I um, I caught, um, I believe it was a Science Friday interview. It was an NPR mm -hmm. piece this summer with David. And uh, you can um, search the NPR site for, for David's names and you'll david's name and you'll find uh, uh a little little bit more on um, his uh, criticisms there and james uh whose grad school research was on uh ocean acidification raises uh, uh a small point that ocean acidification threatens coral reefs and if the coral reef environment is significantly impact that will affect all of the biodiversity on the reefs including shark species that are endemic to reefs uh, and Ruben asks, what's the function of bioluminescence in the ninja shark and others like it? Yeah, so generally speaking, bioluminescence is useful for signaling other members of your species or for scare or for attracting prey or for scaring away predators. Uh, and it's I don't know what it is specifically in the ninja lantern shark, uh, but it's it's usually one of those. And often the particular patterns, are very, very different from species to species. And that suggests this is saying, you see this pattern of lights, oh, that's another ninja lantern shark. Maybe I'll go mate or whatever. Okay, other, and Pat's got a hand up again. So go ahead, Pat. Oh uh, yeah, um, get my mic down here. Uh, I saw a doc, doc documentary about the effect of overfishing and was frightening how what the effect is that they thought it was like twice as many fish are caught as what you expect to no it's more like three or four or more and just dev 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 devastating effect on on uh on the sea yes or a comment not a yeah. question there but yeah, yeah. Uh, also you mean sharknado isn't true <laughs> Sharknado is not true, I'm afraid. Um, there true. actually was a study that discovered that shark, when storms are coming, sharks go offshore and deep to avoid being injured by them. They can sell, sense the change in barometric yeah. pressure. Yep, yeah, they, they aren't stupid. <laughs> uh, and I have, oh, oh, Ruben's got another question. Go ahead, Ruben. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I I actually had to. I had one. Uh, can you explain the liver? Because I know sharks lack the swim bladder. How does like the liver function in uh, the buoyancy in uh, the sharks? And uh, okay, yeah, that's the first question. Yeah, so the sharks do not have a swim bladder like other fishes do. They have a huge liver, and it can sometimes fill much of their whole body cavity, and it's very oily, so that's lighter than water, and it's just but it's just buoyant by virtue of its its oiliness. So how do they control to like go uh, up and down using the liver? Do they produce more or less oil? Or? It, it, it doesn't work at that sort of scale. That just keeps them from sinking. Um, and then they sort of just swim up or swim down if they want to go up or down. Okay, and thank you. Uh, and the second question is on on mangroves uh, and and conservation because uh, I know I think the I believe the uh, lemon shark relies on on the mangroves uh, which are being destroyed. So isn't like isn't that like not a big threat if you attack uh, for the breeding grounds of this shark species is that not going to like you know kill them? You you cut off there. I, oh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I was, I'm not sure what saying, the question was. Sorry. Isn't the conservation of like the habitats of uh, sharks like like the mangrove forest is that not uh, more important than uh, or, or quite important too? 
it's important for some species and some populations of some species, but overfishing is the number one threat by far, so much so that the, the, these other things are, are just minor local scale issues generally. We're talking right, about extinction you. in 10 to 20 years if we don't deal with overfishing, and these other issues are just not at that, not at that scale. Thank you, fascinating stuff. A uh, couple more questions in the chat. Um, James says, I'd like David to comment on human practices that have made shark attack incidents worse, like on La, La Re Reunion, um, which gives sharks a bad rep, even though it's the human practice that caused the problem. I'm not sure what's being referenced there. Uh, Reun what's happening in Reunion is there are more bull sharks attacking people, but it is not very, it's still not very many. And there's been no conclusive evidence as to what is or is not causing it. Uh, so I'm not sure what's being discussed there. I know people who work on that case study and it's a, a long-term study site and there are absolutely not results yet saying that what is or is not responsible. Okay. And Mark asks, what's your favorite shark and why is it the great white, which I've read enough of your book to know that's <laughs> not great whites. Great whites are, <laughs> yeah, they're fine. Most great whites are actually mediocre. They're just very confident. Um, <laughs> but the, my favorite shark is the sandbar shark. Follow hashtag best shark on Twitter and Instagram, and you'll learn all about sandbar sharks. Uh, and a question I have from um, from starting to read your book, I have not finished it, um, but it's it noted that you started as both a dinosaur geek and a shark geek. How do we lose you? Oh, it looks like we're just about out of time here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I I talk to people who work in those fields. And I've said just basically, what's your day like? And what do you feel like you're contributing to? And uh, I would rather spend my time in the Caribbean on a boat trying to stop animals from going extinct than in places like the Montana desert to understand what happened to animals that are already extinct. Not that the other one's not important and valid and uh, contributes in lots of ways to under our understanding of the natural world. But I'm trying to, I, I, the conservation angle is what got me. All right, all right. I will. I, I'll, I'll take it, and I, I will note I'm not a paleontologist, but my colleagues will fight you. Um, and Ryan asks, "Is it true the Greenland shark can live uh, 400 years?" Which you you mentioned. Do you want to say a little bit about um, about how it is that they live 400 years? Yeah. So the way that you age a shark is actually the same way you can tell how old a tree is. You cut it in half and you count the rings. Seriously. So the same pattern that leads to tree rings, which is seasonal variation in what resources are available. There's lots of food in the spring. There's not a lot of food in the winter. Uh, it leads to fast growth, slow growth, fast growth, slow growth. And that makes that ring pattern. And the same thing happens on sharks vertebrae. Uh, so that doesn't work when you're talking about animals that live over 100 years old or to be over 100 years old. So they actually use carbon dating to figure out how old Greenland sharks are. And uh, that has notably a pretty high margin of error. And there are some people that are skeptical of that 400 number, but that is the middle of the range. And it is, um, you know, if I, you were to ask me to imagine an animal that lives a really long time, it would live in cold, low oxygen water and grow slowly and move slowly. So, yeah. I know, yeah. I know one of the, the longest lived uh, invertebrate species is a clam um, in Iceland that's over 500 years old, which you can also tell the age of by counting the rings. Um, okay, a couple more questions have popped up. Um, uh, James says, I had heard the increased offshore dumping of trash food waste was attracting sharks in the, and this is on the reunion question. Um, yeah, I, was, I, that, is, that is not what I'm hearing from people who are there and studying it. Uh, okay, good to know. Um, and James follows up, so they had to close beaches because of shark attacks. Um, and NT asks, how do Greenland sharks attack polar bears? Yeah, so we don't know. It's never been observed, but polar bear parts have been found in Greenland shark stomachs. So it might be scavenging of polar bears that drown, but when a polar bear is swimming from ice flow to ice flow, they are vulnerable to being slurped up from below. So in my mind's eye, they, that, happened, that has happened at least once in the history of the Arctic. Okay. And 
um, what was the upper end of the range for the uh, age? I assume I'm not sure. Was. Okay. And and a thanks. Um, are there uh, Ruben's got a hand up? But I'm guessing that's a stale hand up. Is that right? Uh, yeah, correct. <laughs> okay. Are there other questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to put. Um, some links for upcoming uh, stuff in the chat there. Uh, James D'Amico on Tuesday, how to confront climate denial in the evening with, uh, with James D'Amico. Um, and a week from tonight, we'll be on WSKG's Science Pub talking about uh, uh, heat without fire, the deep geothermal uh, project at Cornell University. And there's the link for um, Science in the Virtual Pub so you can see what's coming in 2023. And there's also a link to donate because we are a nonprofit. And if you enjoy this programming, we, uh, we welcome your support. And um, Nico uh, notes that 512 is the upper limit assumption. Um, oh, cool. So there you go. Um, Nico is another one of my PRI colleagues. Uh, other questions, comments, smart remarks? Thank you very much, David. It Thanks, great. everybody. I'm glad we finally connected to make it work. Yeah. Have Thank a great you. rest of your week, everybody. You too. Bye. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you.